or not get a, a, a warning that the, the meeting's being recorded. Um, if you're ready to go, Paul, I'll pull your slides up and um, we can get started. Sure. I can't imitate the Zoom, this meeting is being recorded person, um, which just has changed at least within ICANN. It's surprising everybody when somebody else says that silly thing. So um, I didn't know that this was supposedly going to be slide free. I would have been fine with this being slide free, but um, I will fairly quickly go over what's in the draft, um, although hopefully most people have read it. Um, and then the last slide is about, you know, like future directions and such like that. Uh, before we start, let me be super, super clear. This is one proposal um, on how to do opportunistic. Uh, we have, I have asked, and I think the chairs have asked on the list multiple times, if somebody is interested in, in a proposal for doing uh, fully authenticated um, uh, recursive to authoritative, that we, we actually need a draft on it um, because there's, there's lots of questions about what it means. So in the discussion later, when people say, but you didn't consider X, Y, and Z, if X, Y, and Z are about uh, the, you know, needing authentication, the answer will be, you're right. I didn't consider that because that's literally not part of what we, uh, what this document is about. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, the document itself sort of has three major parts, the use case, which I think is really the most important part. It, um, the protocol part is actually very minimal and actually, depending on how the working group goes, could be made even smaller. Um, really the hard part for people to uh, wrap their head around is the use case. Um, so hope, uh, I have a you know, slide on that and hopefully people can see that in fact, um, if the use case needs to be tweaked a bit, that's fine. But the, the, the use case that we are talking about here is opportunistic only. It's not a blending of the two or anything like that. Um, and then I have a slide about how the resolvers can enable this and how the, the authoritative servers can enable this. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, we'll talk about future possibilities for the draft. And that should hopefully open up for the rest of the agenda that Brian gave, because the future possibilities could be um, we, we, we want this, we want this only under these conditions, we want to wait, you know, whatever. So, um, next slide. So, these are pretty much the exact words in the draft. Um, the use case is not, I'm sorry, did someone hop in? No. Um, the use case, uh, let me do the negative. The use case is not, we need this. And um, so, like, for example, yesterday on the list, Jacques Latour, you know, expressed some concern that people, you know, would be expected to implement this. That is not in this use case. This use case is, hey, a bunch of reserve, recursive resolver operators who know that they're going to have to suck up a little bit of overhead um, would like to see encryption. You know, like, encryption is a good thing. Um, it's also that authoritative servers who are willing to suck up some overhead um, want also want to see that greater encryption. There is not the, you know, this use case is nothing like the use case for encryption on the web. Um, this is the DNS. We're not doing things like opening up systems where we're going to be typing in our passwords. We are not doing a lot of the things for which uh, privacy, which then has to come with authentication, is needed. This is like, let's encrypt what we can, um, prevent man in the middle from, from, from watching unless they are active. Uh, I'm sorry, prevent passive people from watching. It would, you know, the, the only uh, people who would be able to break the encryption are ones who are active anyways. Um, Let's just increase the amount of, of, of uh, encryption for the, you know, for recursive to authoritative. Um, and so then the third bullet really nails down how, what, you know, what the part of this is that is opportunistic is um, that if TLS cannot be set up because of lack, generally because of lack of, of authentication, um, don't fail to serve the queries. Don't take that as a reason to, okay, well, I'm not going to do this. this. You know, 
my own personal belief is that if implementing this causes a significant number of queries that would have worked in plain text to fail, then this is bad. Encryption is good, but it's not so good that we want to start failing a lot of them. Okay, so that's the use case, it is these three things, and that's pretty much it. Um, next slide. Excuse me, I'm going to hydrate. Um, encryption's not free. So there are additional costs, and these are things that have been well understood in the web world um, when they went from it was only your bank site that used uh, TLS, or at that point it was just SSL, to basically like 70, 80% of the websites now. In fact, even if you come to them unencrypted, they upgrade you to encryption. Um, you're going to get, for us, for the recursive to authoritative scenario, you're going to get extra round trips to establish TCP for every, every session. Right now, for example, um, uh, looking at the data from the root servers, and again, I'm not proposing this is for the root servers, um, only about 5% of the queries are, go over TLS. I've been told by somebody at one of the, um, author, you know, who runs one of the authoritative servers for one of the big TLDs, that that's about true also for them. So we're going from 5% TCP to some larger amount. Um, if this gets really popular, it will be a much larger amount. If this doesn't get so popular, it still is a larger amount. But 5% is close enough to zero where people will start seeing things breathe heavily if they have not tuned their kernels correctly just for, you know, for establishing TCP. There's also a cost for the extra round trips for this TLS establishment. And, you know, we can, we can maybe limit that by saying it should always be TLS 1.3. Um, if the working group finishes its work on DNS over quick, that will also, you know, cause fewer round trips. Um, but in fact, it's going to be round trips regardless. So this is a startup time. Um, it might go really fast. It might not, but it's certainly going to be greater than zero, which is what we have now. There is um, CPU usage for TLS establishment. There's almost no extra... TLS, uh, uh, CPU usage for after the TLS session is up for doing the actual encryption. But there is a significant amount of CPU used for TLS establishment. Having said that, in the web world, when people were very, very worried about this and saying, oh, we shouldn't be pushing so quickly on doing HTTPS, it turns out that Moore's law was much more of a lover than a friend. And, and it just, you know, the CPU usage turned out not to be that significant. Um, for us, though, still the first two bullets, the extra round trips, will still always be significant. Um, and then there is definitely going to be greater memory use for holding the TLS state. There is also, I'm sorry, I didn't include this as another bullet, but there's certainly greater memory usage for holding the TCP state as well. Um, those two together are not zero. And so a system that only is having, where the memory overhead is only about 5% of the, of the queries requiring TLS, there's going to be greater memory usage. Again, fortunately, what we've learned from the web world is that even on very active web servers, that amount of memory isn't big. Next slide. So let's this slide and the next slide is how how this the proposal in this uh, um, document might be um, enabled. So for a resolver, this proposal says that you must have a cache that tells you ahead of time whether you should try to do DOT or if we get to DOQ as well. Something you know a, a cache that tells you that it it says do not incur the overhead of testing when you start up for, for a particular authoritative. So um, you fill the cache out of band, and you, when, when you're about to start a connection to an authoritative server, you look and say, oh, this one does the thing I want to do, great. Or I don't know, so I'm not going to try it. Maybe I'll put that as a query for later. Or your cache might say, 
I already tried that and no, they don't, don't even think of it. Um, so you do a TCP connection, you start TLS, and you authenticate only if it's useful. Um, at this point, we don't have any active drafts that say why authentication is useful. Uh, Peter Van Dyke and a few other people had some uh, in a draft that's now expired. It's not clear, you know, there, there was an interest in that. So this bullet might get changed by the working group later if we decide that there is no useful reason for authenticating. Um, if there are useful reasons, then you do authenticate if you can. Um, but seriously, for people, if there isn't a useful authentication use case, you just ignore the authentication result. Um, it might be faster if you didn't authenticate, but there's a lot of, of um, SSL stacks that won't let you not authenticate. You sort of have to go through the authentication and ignore it. Again, that's a CPU usage, not a huge one. So that's all, that is the entire how resolvers would turn this on. Notice that there's almost no interoperability here. The only thing where there's interoperability is what port do I start on if I'm gonna do TLS or, or what other port do I start on if I'm gonna do DOQ. Other than that, how you run your cache, how you authenticate or not or whatever, none of that has interoperability issues. And um, I got a little bit of criticism that the current draft has too much prescription. That was because the working group wanted to see more prescription in the past. I'd be happy to rip that out. Next slide. So um, how the authoritative turned on? You turn on TLS. I'm not sure why there's a tilde there. I <laughs> So much for my typing. Um, but basically, you turn on TLS as a way for somebody to interact with you. Um, TLS requires a few things. It requires a port, but it also requires a certificate. If authentication is going to be considered at all important, you should prob a, a, an authoritative server should have a certificate that can be authenticated. Um, but if we decide to only support opportunity, you know, the working group for now, or possibly long term, only is interested in opportunistic, then you don't really even need a good certificate per se. You could just use a self-issued certificate that no one would be able to authenticate, you know, cool. Um, uh, that, you know, the, the certificate stuff is covered in the draft, but that's very much open and it very much depends on how the working group wants to consider this in light of other proposals. And then you just serve normally. That's it. It's just turn on TLS, watch stuff happen. Um, next slide. So this is my last slide here. So we starting in, you know, we're only 18 minutes in, then we'll be slide free. So uh, one of the questions is, does the working group want to adopt it? That's, you know, uh, Certainly always the other one. Um, the current document after we had this uh, similar discussion to this um, during the meeting uh, last fall, the, the working group meeting last call, people said that I should focus on just doing probing for um, how, to, how to add discovery for the cache. So I did, but quite frankly, TLSA records are probably faster than probing uh, because they can be done over UDP. Um, so maybe we could add those in. Probing, again, will not be something where we have to talk, think about uh, interoperability. Um, if we add TLSA records, yes, we might say what kind of TLSA record, but that's it. And then really the working group has to pick something to do with the optional authentication. And, and I give pretty much the two choices here, and they are extreme choices, but I think there really isn't anything in the middle. I, I mean, if I'm wrong, that's fine. But... Um, Either the working group would say, we define where authentication during opportunistic is useful, and if so, then I need to write more about handling authentication. Or if the working group decides that there isn't a, any reason to authenticate during opportunistic, again, this is regardless of the other one, then I can just nuke everything that's, that's about authentication, and that you know, simplifies the document significantly. Um, Great, let's go to a slideless uh, uh, um, interim meeting. Okay, um, looks like Ben has a question. Hi, Ben Schwartz. 
I'm uh, so thanks for these changes to the draft. I support adoption. I think that probably the authentication tech could be removed as you offered. Uh, among other things, the current text doesn't uh, doesn't make it clear to me what identity one would authenticate. And there are several different potential reference identities in play here. Uh, if we can't pick one, then we risk an interoperability problem if people disagree about what the appropriate identity is. Um, it's worse than that. If we pick two, then every authoritative server has to decide whether it's going to do both of them. For all these good reasons, I think we should just remove it. Thanks for uh, including the the recommendations on timeouts. I, I think that that's going to be really helpful for people experimenting and trying to build up operational experience here. Uh, sure. I, and I, I, as I said in the current draft, the data that I use, the research that I use, I haven't published yet. It's in the long, tedious publication process within ICANN. I am assuming that I will have that published within a month and a half, but where I got those numbers. Um, and to be clear, those numbers are based on a 99th percentile from a distant place. Uh, the 50th percentile is way faster than what's in the draft. I think it'll be really interesting to, to work through the details there, but um, I think it's a good direction. Uh, I do I, another look at the draft and realize that the, the transport cache is not very clear about whether it's keyed by uh, IP address or name yeah. server name or <laughs> delegating domain um, it's not and i don't know whether i want it to be but that should be mentioned regardless uh okay uh yeah i'm i think uh ip address seems to be the the consensus of the people i've talked to but i'm happy for the draft to leave it unspecified oh no i, I would like to specify all the ideas again I'm assuming, given that this is not um, an interoperability issue, that we're going to see good creativity from the resolver vendor. Yeah. And I think that you know, me thinking, oh, what should they do now is really bad because I'm not even one of them. So the one, know, yeah. The, the one thought I had to mention about changes here is I, I want to make sure we're clear that that we're not telling people that they have to implement the the fallback um to to insecure to to unencrypted um universally so they 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 should under the conditions we're talking about but if you imagine a future resolver that implements both your opportunistic pattern described here and an authenticated ah. pattern then if you hit an authentication failure on a properly authenticated query you should fail hard and not, uh, and, and that should override this. So it was just the text uh, should make clear that that the fallback can be overridden by authentication. So I failure. think I can put that in the security considerations section. Sure. Of if, you know, which is where we often say if something different happens in the future, um, because we still have questions of how that would go and who would use it and such like that. But yes, putting something in there saying, um, don't, don't, you know, like like. There might be some reason why you don't want to fall back in the future that has been described in other places. Sure. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Dwayne, you're next. All right. Thanks. Um, so uh, I support adoption of this as well. Um, I, I would like to see, um, I think TLS, TLSA is a better signaling mechanism than just simple uh, port probing. So I would like to see that as the um, the preferred, if not the only, um, you know, way of, of doing um, uh, Ooh. Opportunity, opportunity encryption. Uh, why O? Um, because for two reasons. One is that requires every, authentic, every authoritative server to be able to put a TLSA record for the name of the server, and they may not be in control of that. That's one reason. But the other is that it requires, um, uh, TLSA requires uh, you to be a validating resolver. And we know that fewer than 30% of the resolvers on the internet um, are validating. I wouldn't want to restrict this to them. 
Okay, well, uh, I guess that's something to be uh, discussed yeah. more than. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I buy your first argument that that people aren't always in control of their of their names, but um, I guess we can we can fight about that later. Um, yeah. And and um, one last point. Um, it's it's probably implied in, in in the draft, but maybe it could be made more more explicit that um, you know any authoritative server that doesn't support encryption shouldn't have to you know do anything differently than it's already doing and should be impacted as little as possible. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, next in the queue is Peter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, a um, few points. I support adoption. I really like how this draft has found a middle ground where probing is not in the hot resolver path. Uh, this also means that for any freshly started resolver, the first few queries, queries to some name server will be unencrypted, but that's a trade over making here. Um, let's see what else did I have. To Ben's last point, it would be nice if name servers that do not support any encryption do fail fast on port 853, but I also see how we cannot demand that of them. Uh, as for TLSA, there's a problem there that to the de delegation name server data is not signed. <laughs> so if you want to do authenticated, which we are not mo mostly not talking about here, but if you want to do authenticated, then you need to fix that on the TLD side. And if you are using TLSA just as a signal, then you will still need to look up the name servers for a domain at the authority, authoritatives, uh, unencrypted. So you will still be leaking the domain name. Uh, and as for Ben's point about people not being in control or Ben saying, I believe people are generally, generally in control of the name server names. Uh, as has come up in many discussions on DeepRive, there are basically two classes of domains. There are the million of domains hosted on Cloudflare, GoDaddy, etc. And there are the name servers that have one domain or five domains. Uh, and it is possible that there is no one size fits all. Thank you. Um, one quick note on what Peter just said. Uh, I think, I don't even remember if I said port 853 in the current draft. Um, we yes. pick a different port. That is, 853, 853 is cute, but in in the transport world, there is a <laughs> there are very strongly opinionated people on both sides of the argument of whether overloading um, a port number and this an already signed port number is a good idea. Um, because then we save port numbers, even though we don't need to save them, or it's a bad idea because it overloads things and it causes confusion. So I'm not, I, I will probably, if I say 853 currently, I'm going to take it out and we may end up with it anyways. Can I just quickly respond? Sure. Um, I agree. Right now, 53 is, is overloaded for out and recursion, has been away for 30 years, and it actually is quite messy. So I had a thought about that, but it makes a lot of sense to me to allocate a separate port for out DOT. Yeah. And hopefully, again, my personal preference is that we, we also get DOQ, that this doesn't have to be, that, 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 that DNS over quick will be a better solution for this. It'll take a long time, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, five years from now, if, if assuming this goes forward, I would be thrilled if most of this traffic was actually running over quick. Sure. I realize that the dot pin draft also uses 853, so maybe that's a topic for a separate document allocating an, an out DOT port. Great, Thank, thanks, Peter. Yeah, um, and it looks like we have another Ben sighting on the, in the queue. Oh, same Ben. <laughs> uh, okay, I I think on the port number, I think we should use port 853. Uh, and uh, I think that I, I like the, the DNS as it stands, where there is a DNS transport protocol and, uh, or a DNS transport layer, essentially. And the, the question of whether a given query is 
recursive or authoritative is is a topic for that specific query as not a property of the transport. But uh, the one thing I like about this draft is that for the most part, that is out of scope. This the draft puts that uh, puts that entire topic out of scope. And um, to Dwayne's point about TLSA, it also puts that topic uh, largely out of scope because it simply says that that the way in which you populate the transport cache is um, is implementation defined. Uh, on the topic of TLSA, I tend to think that somehow TLSA will end up playing a role in our authenticated uh, authoritative encryption story. But exactly how that works is yet to be determined. I think that we don't need to worry about it right now. At some point in the future, when we've figured that out, uh, we can we can circle back and see if it has some effect on this. I, I kind of think it, it won't. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, thanks, Paul. And so what we're going to do now, well, first of all, I'm going to remind everybody that they should go into the uh, the Code EMD blue sheet and and sign um, the uh, our, our, our 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 attendee list is it evidently is is far larger than the number of people who have signed the blue sheets. Um, so what we want to do now is take um, about. 40 minutes or so to discuss some of the, the, the aspects of, of, of the opportunistic encryption draft and talk about it from the perspective of the, um, the, the recursive resolvers. So before we, so, okay. Thought somebody jumped in the queue and then they jumped out. So what I wanna do is just have this as an open discussion. So you know, use the same you know, plus Q minus Q notation in the, uh, in the WebEx chat. And we'll try and do this as orderly as possible. But I think the first topic that that I'm interested in, uh, and I've heard several people mention at least to me at, 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 a, at a, in a variety of uh, situations, is is really kind of related to the authentication that Paul brought up. You know, we our our charter is focused on the privacy aspects of of moving data from an from a recursive resolver to an authoritative. So um, so if people have comments or thoughts on the the impact of this approach um, to the recursive resolvers, um, and uh, just as kind of a primer, I'd like to, to focus more on the on the authentication question first. But but any topic related to recursive resolvers is, is 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 fair game. So, so either people can't hear what I'm saying. They're either off signing the blue sheets, or they're not sure what what um, what what we what would be the topic related to authentication. So, I we would hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I. I yeah. Um. So, so my 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 basic view of this is that you know our focus is more on on protecting the data that's in transit and not necessarily trying to authenticate. The, the the entity that is providing the answer. So, I, I would state that I think the the assumption that we can do opportunistic encryption is is um is is um is valid and and that we should explore this as much as possible. Uh, ben, you're in. I'm sorry. I guess I don't understand the question. Are you asking about how about authentication in the context of Paul's draft here? Oh, I'm, yes. Uh, so I'm I'm talking about the use of opportunistic encryption without authentication. Do, do people who um, have a view from the recursive resolver's perspective have a concern with that? Okay, um, I'm not sure what perspective I I can claim to represent here, but uh, I think 
opportunistic encryption is valuable, and I, I, I so I'm a, a huge advocate of authenticated uh, encryption that's downgrade resistant. Um, but I think opportunistic is very valuable here, especially for shaking out those resource utilization concerns that Paul highlighted. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter. What Ben said, thank you. Does anybody have a contrary view to the to um, authentication in this context? So does anybody else have thoughts or comments, questions on on the use of opportunistic encryption from the from the recursive resolver perspective. Paul. So this is not contrary, but um, there were a couple of people, none of whom seem to be on this call today, who had <laughs> objected earlier um, and I will repeat what one of them said, um, because I thought that it was actually a reasonable um, summary of why not to do opportunistic from the recursive side, which is that it's half-assed, or since it's Tony Finch, half-arsed. Um, and so my question is, are there resolver operators here who in fact feel like this is only a first step, but we're going like that they already have a use case for a step beyond it. Because if we don't, that changes this draft significantly. If we do, then um, you know it would be good to know sooner so that I'm not ripping stuff out and then adding it back in later. Thanks. Yeah, I I, I agree with that perspective, Paul. And, and and just to be clear, you know, this is this is just a a working discussion and. You know, we, we have to make sure that we 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 get the feedback from other participants in the working group who have had you know contrary views to this. So you know, don't think that anything that we 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 decide or think today is going to be set in stone. The, the working group on the mailing list still has to to do the the consensus on, on what they look like. Uh, Peter, hello. I'm not speaking for any resolver operators, but I am aware of Cloudflare and Facebook having an agreement where. Cloudflare can send them EDNS client subnet data, which they do not send to anybody else because they have agreed on using TLS. However, they are doing this by agreement, so they don't need anything we do for that. Uh, I personally don't think that TLS is should be required for ECS, but that is the one data point I have. Yeah, this is probably just more for my, my benefit, Peter. <laughs> Is, is that information that you just got from people that you know, or is that actually documented somewhere? I, I'm pretty sure I got it from the Cloudflare blog, blog or the Facebook blog or something. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if we are, I mean, I don't like probing, but if we are doing opportunistic, that is the only way uh, to do that. The other thing is what Peter said, if you have an agreement and you know that the server you're going to support it, then you can kind of hardwire it. Um, but for as a DNS person, I'd rather see something where we have in the resolution process an authenticated way of getting to a server, but that's obviously further off. <sighs> Thanks. Thanks, Ralph. Any other comments that people have on on, on the opportunistic encryption at the uh, recursive resolver?
Okay, we we can circle back to this if, if other other questions come up later. So let's let's turn the the the, the view around and and think about the opportunistic encryption from from the authoritative server's perspective. Um, I, I think Paul's draft does a, a good job of kind of pointing out the the high level things that that need to be done. Are, what are the you know questions, concerns, comments that people have from from that perspective with with the use of um, Uh, Peter, I just breaking the silence here a bit. Uh, I, will, I believe the draft indeed covers most of the uh, things needed from an authoritative, and I, I think I'd like to echo what maybe Ben said or maybe not that we probably shouldn't specify authentication at all, so the document could be shorter. And then the only open question is if we want to also do authenticated in the future then it would be great if people don't have to rebuild everything, uh, but it might be unavoidable. So basically, I think the draft could be shorter in this area because the requirements on the outside are very slim, other than the CPU and memory pressure that Paul already mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Peter again. Hello. Uh, I wonder if Dwayne or anybody else involved in TLD operations would be willing to comment on their willingness to open up DOT. Um, that is not something that I can comment on or commit to this time in any way. <laughs> All right. Other comments, questions? Uh, Jim. Thanks. Just a quick response to what Peter had said by asking for information from TLD operators. This could be tricky because most TLDs are now running a bunch of servers so some are operated by themselves and some are operated by third parties. So it could be tricky to try and get get them into a situation where all of the name servers that they have in the VAR app set are supporting uh, TLS queries. Scott. Uh, thank you. Um, so just picking up a little bit on what Dwayne mentioned, um, I can say uh, that at least right now, VeriSign does not have any plans to support this. Um, we are concerned a bit about the types of performance and resource consumption considerations that Paul mentioned earlier. Um, you know, for us, availability is priority number one. And if the, uh, you know, the comm servers or the root servers we operate take any kind of a, of a downtime hit, that would be very bad, you know, from an internet infrastructure perspective. So we're, we're going to be watching uh, primarily to see how this all plays out, you know, before we make any decisions about turning anything on. Uh, thanks, Scott. Paul? So Jim just mentioned something interesting about um, 
you know, the fact that many, many operators, not just TLD operators, actually have multiple uh, providers. Um, which then goes back to the question, and, and thank you, Jim, because I hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, the transport cache, if the transport cache is by IP address, and I have like both my, my own personal, you know, domain names are done at, uh, are, are the, the name servers are at q.secondary2.com and r.secondary2.com. If I wanted to try this, I could turn TLS on one of them, you know, because they have separate IP addresses, and then um, see if it melts down. So even if that got into somebody's cache as a, oh yes, look, if you care about, uh, my vanity domain name is proper.com. If you care about proper.com, you know, one name server has it and one doesn't and you try the one that has it and it's it's now gone south because it's melted down or whatever you still you still know that the other one is there and you wouldn't need to try it so um i think that I, even though this is completely non-normative i think that a discussion of this would would be reasonable in the draft as a way of saying if you're an authoritative server and you want to start looking at this here is how you could do a soft roll for adding um, and and then see you know see what the implications are. Um, I agree with what Scott Hollenbeck just said um, in the sense that as I said, my vanity domain name is proper.com, so I don't want to see the .com name servers melt down. Um, but they could also possibly, if they felt like it, I don't work for Verisign, not telling them what to do. They could turn it on on one of the zillion .com name servers, see what happens. So anyways, I, I think that if we adopt this document, I think a, an operational discussion of it, um, of, ha of how a rollout might happen uh, would be reasonable and, and that would be like in a separate section um, that could be ignored or whatever. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next up is Allison. Hi, yeah, um, I uh, have a comment about that was triggered by Jim. I think Jim's point was really good. Um, the uh, the uh, use of multiple providers really is common, and it raises two questions for me. One is, um, if we're assuming it's okay for some some authoritative services to not have it on, uh, are we really saying that that the perform the privacy guarantee that might be offered is very minimal from the point of view of the authoritatives. That's question number one. In other words, they hope you'll get what you want, but you might actually never get what you want. You may have a, you know, you may have quite a difficult time with that. Uh, question two is, could you, sorry, I want to put three questions in because I don't talk too much. The question two is, uh, for the sake of doing the soft rollout, I believe you could even uh, use a name server which is not in the name server set and, and have people test against it with explicit reference to it. Um, it wouldn't give you a lot of uh, sense. Of, and so you could load against it and see its performance behavior without um, without actually having customers getting it and having disappointments. Um, and the third question is, would it be in the scope of this document for um, uh, to advise very privacy oriented recursive servers to uh, identify the the uh, the uh, the parts of the footprint that do TLS and try to maintain them in some form so that they they really don't usually send you off to a non TLS one um, if you are, if you're if you you're a client of them and you know they know you care about privacy so three questions thanks Allison. Um, next up is Jim. <laughs> yeah, Paul, when Paul spoke about caching, uh, that sort of triggered another evil thought that I had. Um, I think it's quite common to come across authoritative name servers that have got short lived time to live values on the address records for the NS records. So the NS records have got a time to live value perhaps a few hours or a day or so. But I've come across situations where the TTLs on the address records for them. And only the matter of a minute or maybe a few seconds or so. So when we have a situation where our DNS provider is flipping the IP addresses that, that it's actually using to provide service on, 
at short notice. So you could run a server for one query, which is supporting TLS. The provider flips to another server on the same physical IP address, and then that other server doesn't do TLS at all. And that messes up the cache that Paul was talking about for keeping track of this stuff. Is that a corner case we should worry about? Thanks, Jim. Uh, Alex. Um, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I have a related question that, that uh, re regarding the, the, the cache confusion, let me put it that way, and IP addresses, if we decide to use IP addresses, the cache key. And, and um, my concern comes from the fact that in an any cast that environment where the IP address is actually ending up on like hundreds of nodes uh, that might even use different providers and might even you have different transport capabilities, um, the resolvers might end up like switching back and forth between uh, the information that that IP address supports TLS and that it doesn't or a dot. Um, so I think we should if we if we decide that the key would be the IP address. Um, then we should put in some text into the, the document that uh, special considerations should be given to any cast that environments or something like that. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Paul? Hi, thank you. Um, let me try to answer Allison's, or at least the first and the third of Allison's question. Um, the first one was about a privacy guarantee. Absolutely not. There, 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 it is easy to show that, that privacy guarantees are going to go to hell on this one. Uh, for example, if you start up TLS and the, uh, the, the, resolver, the resolver's client and the authoritative server um, don't agree on um, encryption algorithms, then TLS won't get set up. And that's, it says that explicitly in the draft. So there is no privacy guarantee here. Opportunistic really means just if we can. And I guess that actually ties to Allison's third question about the privacy-oriented resolvers with, you know, we've written about, or she's written about certainly, um, in the working group. Um, this is unrelated to them other than this gives them a, in my mind, non-documentable way of doing better. But, you know, uh, any documentation that comes out of this, I think, I, I don't think it, I don't think it should be documented. I don't, I don't, I, I mean, maybe a privacy oriented resolver might say, in addition to what I promised you before, I was also able to encrypt 20% of my traffic to authoritative servers. But who knows, all of that might have been, you know, hit by a man in the middle. I don't know. So. I would say let's stay out of that. Maybe I, I need to say that in the document is that um, the guarantees are weak and not even verifiable. So let's not go there. Let's, you know, for the privacy oriented resolvers, let's keep doing the good stuff that's in the drafts and the RFCs. Um, and then. Paul, did you mute yourself? I think I did. Thank you. I <laughs> that was interesting. Um, so um, Ed, for for Jim's thing about short TTLs, um, I, this is something. And in fact, this goes actually to Alex's question as well. Of you know what what do we key on? I don't want this document to be saying that. Maybe if we adopt the document and we get a year or two's um, experience, then we can come back and document some of the experience. But I really want this to be hard work for the resolver vendors. Sorry, folks. But I do think that you're going to have to be creative. I think you're going to have to talk to each other. I think you're going to have to compete, which I think is very cool for having the better cash, the more effective cash, the bigger cash, whatever. Um, I don't want to go out the gate with us putting our thumb on the scale for how these caches should work. We really, really don't know. And by the way, this is exactly what happened in the web world 
oh Jesus, almost 30 years ago with web caching, not quite 30 years ago, but more than 25 years ago with web caching, is the initial descriptions of web caches turned out to be restrictive and wildly off from what really happened. And I don't, I don't want to go there. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, ben? Hi, Ben Schwartz, same topic. Uh, so you spoke earlier, Paul, about the idea of turning this on for just one of the many name servers for a zone. Correct. Um, depending on, so there are a few ways to think about that. One way is to say we turn this on just for one named name server, you know, essentially for one NS record. Yep. Another way is to say that we turn it on for one IP address. Um, one one literal server that's um, among the IP addresses, the multiple IP addresses that represent one, that correspond to one NS record. Could be. Um, in that latter case, we have, uh, we run into an issue with certain kinds of transport caches. Yep, absolutely. That's what Alex brought up. Right. Um, so this is definitely related to, so Alex was talking about any cast rollouts. In that case, it's even more extreme. There is, <laughs> okay, there is, yeah. there is no key um, visible to the recursive resolver that would allow it to distinguish between uh, between servers that do and do not have this capability within the pool. So I, I think that this is actually essentially relevant to interoperation. And while we may not need to fully specify the caching behavior, we do need to um, we need to figure out what the guardrails are there. Uh, Fair point. I can I can see that as in it if it's done operationally poorly, you're going to possibly be blocking people in ways you don't know. And it, because you don't you don't control the way that the resolvers are going to be running their, you know, there, there's going to be many kinds of caches on the resolvers. And there, right. there are some things to think about. Okay, fair point. So yeah, so imagine that, you know, you, you turn on this thing on, on one of your IP addresses, um, and then what you see is uh, suddenly you have a, a marked increase in latency for all of your users because there are a ton of users who are trying to hit other server nodes uh, and waiting for a timeout. On, on TLS before falling back because they got the um, they got this entry in their transport cache. Now maybe you know on failure we immediately wipe the you say like on failure you need to wipe the transport cache um, for the you know, wipe that cache cache entry um, and that will that'll help. Maybe that's, that's good the way they do it in the web world. So I would hope so. But so maybe we do have some advice um, without but but. I agree with um, what Jason Livingood said about that the current draft is a bit too prescriptive. I would like it to be less prescriptive, but we might be able to write some of these options in without seeming prescriptive at all. And I, I would want help from those of you who operate resolvers and authoritatives on that. Yeah, and I'm very, um, uh, I'm definitely on on the same page as Alex here that we need good support for gradual rollout across any cast systems. Uh, and so that that basically is talking about transport cache behavior. We can imagine crazy things like an explicit opt out. You can place a particular record in your zone that says like, no, don't do opportunistic uh, with this zone. And that allows you to do a gradual rollout and not get user traffic until you're ready for it. But um, even even without that complexity, you know, maybe we can maybe we can avoid that complexity if we can put the right guardrails on transport cache behavior. Okay, so that, that's okay. Uh, so I will back off from my "let's not discuss it" stance from 15, 20 minutes ago. I think I think this does um, show that a discussion would be useful as long as it's not prescriptive. All right, thank you guys, uh, Stephen. Hey, uh, so when. Things like uh, mail, SMTP over TLS was largely running in opportunistic mode for a number of years. And then people started to be more interested in doing it a bit better with more strict use of TLS there. Uh, apparently, one of the things a lot of operators found useful was the ability to gather reports as to how other people are perceiving what you've configured on your servers. Um, 
And so another thing they liked was to be able to indicate that they're only testing, they're not being really serious. That was maybe more in the context of DMARC. Given that we're talking about a, maybe a similar type of deployment strategy that where people try things out, people are uh, you know, partially deploying, um, some people are very big and have many, many servers. Uh, you know, in fact, in one of the mail cases, uh, one of the very large mail providers said they found it really useful to, to, in case one of their thousands of instances was badly configured, that they might find out about that. So some kind of reporting uh, that allows, let's say, a recursive to tell an authoritative in a bulk or a batch way if they choose to do it. Uh, you know, I, I see your config at this time with this particular instance as authenticating or not authenticating or using this or that or the other uh, set of parameters. So I, I'm not arguing strongly for it. I, I just operations people said in the context of mail that that was really useful, uh, especially while in this partial opportunistic deployment stage. So I think it might be worth considering here. Is that the case too? All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, Peter. Yes, hi. Um, I initially agreed with Jason that the draft was too prescriptive, and I, I still agree. I also agreed with Jason that it should be shorter. But after hearing Paul and Ben just discuss this, uh, I also feel that the draft should describe the concerns without telling you what to do about it. And I would be happy to help with that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Jim. Just to throw in some more complexity, sorry, Ben. Um, and I think there's something for discussion rather than being restrictive. But perhaps we have to think about the scenario where a resolving server fails to be able to locate a, a, an authoritative server that's offering TLS and then goes berserk by chasing around all of the NS records in the RF set, trying to speak TLS to them and not succeeding and just getting itself either into an infinite loop or, worst case, flooding all the authoritative servers with excessive queries and TCP connections. Thanks, Jim. Any other uh, comments, discussion points? Okay, um, so let, let's talk about what we want to try and, and do with this going forward. Um, I, I made a couple of notes here, so I'll, I'll, you know, gladly have people correct me since I'm I'm trying to multitask with with, you know, tracking the the, the queue and and, um, and and take notes at the same time. Uh, so it, it it seems clear that people are interested in, in having the work group uh, do a poll for adoption on on the opportunistic encryption draft. Uh, there are some comments that were made that I think Paul said would would probably be reflected back into the document. Uh, does does anybody have any concerns with doing an adoption call prior to those updates being made? And and the reason why I asked that question is because once the document's adopted by the if if the document is adopted by the working group, then the contents will be consensus driven, and, and we can have you know all sorts of discussions about you know what should or shouldn't be in the document. So. If, if anybody has a concern about me doing an adoption call on the current version of the document, um, you know, feel free to speak up or or let the chairs know soon.
And then it sounds like once we're we're happy with the uh, with 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 an adoption call, then you know there are some 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 points that were made today that it sounded like people uh, agreed needed to be addressed or should be addressed in the document in order to make it um, you know clear as to to what's going on here. Um, so if um, if people have other potential or proposed changes that they would like to see to this document, I would say, you know, keep note of them or at least let Paul know that, you know, you're going to make a proposal for changes to the document. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, the chairs and and Tim and I, or basically Tim and I will get together and talk about, you know, starting a work group adoption call for the, for the um, opportunistic encryption draft. Are there other other comments or, or topics that people want to discuss while we have a, a, a quorum of us here to to, to 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 be involved in? Ben, I think that this is going to need some interop testing. Um, so I'd like like uh, people to think about how they'd like to structure and participate in some in some good interop. That, that's actually a really good point, Ben. Thank you. Um, and I do know that um, I think Jim made a comment in the uh, in the um, in the chat room that at least some of this could be, you know, parts of a hackathon project. So that that's a one avenue for us to consider as well. Uh, Paul, uh, riffing off of what Ben just said, so um, old timers on this call will remember that I used to run interop events. Um, like like in, in the Paleolithic era of the 90s. Um, one of the things that I would promise to do is if we did interop events is that I would not participate, but I would be sitting there listening and watching. Um, I think that having a document author participating in an interop event is a, a bad idea, um, but having having the document authors only hear about a summary result is also a bad idea. So. Um, Michael Richardson, who I can see on the call, probably remembers that we had that very issue on a lot of the IPsec interoperability events. Um, but I, I would be, if if you know, if the document is adopted and anyone pulls together an interop event, and I'm happy to organize one as long as I'm not a participant. Um, I, I would, I think that that would help the document uh, tremendously. Thanks, Paul. Allison? Um, I really like the idea of an interop, and I'm sure that um, we over in the DNS Privacy Project will support that uh, in, and participate in that, rather. Um, I also wanted to mention that, uh, I hope that's all right to plug this, but um, on the um, 21st of January, we have the DNS Privacy Workshop again at NDSS, and one of our panels we're not having a panel, but we're going to have an open discussion about sort of the research directions related to everything. And I think there will be a lot of interest in research. Um, what's what's not known, what is still to be researched about the uh, recursive to the authoritative, or what as the researchers seem to call it, above the recursive. So I thought people might want to sign up to join us on that workshop. It's a virtual workshop. 21st of February, I believe. Uh, it's on a Sunday. Excellent, thank you. All right, last last call for, for comments and discussions for the interim. Okay, Tim or Eric, any um, any last thoughts from from your perspective? No, on my side, I'm all set. Happy to see the discussion coming. I just wanted to thank all the folks for correcting my um, my comments in the in the minutes. I was as I was quickly taking notes, I noticed that the authors or the the speakers were going back and fixing up what I was what they were saying. So I thank you for that.
All right. Well, if that's all everybody has, then uh, we will call it uh, an interim. And uh, we will, Tim and I will will discuss the uh, the call for adoption for for Paul's draft, uh, and 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 pulling the the minutes together to submit to the to um, to the meeting materials. Um, so we will give you back almost uh, almost fifty minutes of your of your day or evening. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, and you know feel free to reach out to to. to to, to Tim and me, if uh, if you have any questions or comments about uh, what's going on in the working group, thanks all. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. <laughs>